A Closer Look at Non-Dual Love with me, C.R. Chuck Dunning, Jr. After a recent contemplative dialogue on non-dual love with a spiritual companion, it seemed that it might be worthwhile to offer more explanation of my views and practice in this regard. First, the term non-dual love signifies that even though we ordinarily experience and express love in dualistic ways like attraction versus repulsion, affection versus dislike, caring versus indifference, kindness versus hatred, respect versus contempt, and even loving versus unloving, love in the divine sense transcends and subsumes these oppositions. So within this view, contrasting non-dualistic love with dualistic love is also problematic. It must be acknowledged that non-duality is ultimately ineffable because language is inherently dualistic. Thus, non-dual love must always remain somewhat mysterious, and any attempt to explain it cannot avoid some degree of self-contradiction. These are mystical waters where intuition and inspiration guide our reasoning. In my forthcoming book, A Rosequois Oratory, I speak at length about the centrality of love in the 18th degree of the Scottish Rite in all of Masonry, in Rosicrucianism, Esoteric Christianity, and other traditions. Perhaps most challengingly, I present love in its grandest and most complete sense as divine and thus non-dual, as in this excerpt. There is nothing more important than love. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In human terms, love is the desire for, experience of, and expression of the divine. Since all things are united in God's presence, Everything we do is in some way driven by love, an expression of love and an experience of love, whether it be the love of God, nature, truth, others, or self. Even the things we regard as evil can be understood as twisted, distorted, often extremely one-sided manifestations of love. While not intended to be so, that last statement can be jarring and abrasive. It may be especially so when we acknowledge how neglectful, bitter, abusive, and destructive human beings can be to each other, and more so as we empathize with the victims. It's perfectly understandable to feel some resistance to the idea that love is the driving force of all things. I have felt that resistance myself. In order to offer suggestions on how to understand and work with the idea of a universal love behind the worst of human attitudes and behaviors, nine years ago, I wrote a short three-piece series for my blog on Christian mysticism. The blog is Mystic Way of the Heart, and the series is entitled Transcendent Love Toward a Non-Dualist View and Practice. While there are a few things in it that I could amend today, it still captures much of how we can relate to love hidden within even the most heinous acts. In the third part of that series, I wrote the following on practicing mindfulness of love as non-dual and ever-present. When we find ourselves reacting to an experience as though it is somehow opposed to love, this practice begs us to look beyond the surface and deeply into the desires, motives, intentions, hopes, and fears that have shaped our judgments of it, and perhaps those that have played more external roles in the experience. Most of us know what it's like to see the mask of hostility on the face of a loved one, initially respond to it with our own defensive hostility, and then later discover that love was there even if it was only the other person's self-love, fearfully hiding behind that mask. Love never left. We just failed to recognize it in our knee-jerk reactions of self-protection, of our own self-love. 
To some of us, it may even be apparent that all hostility and violence in the world is the result of creatures all acting in their own self-love, competing with each other for survival, comfort, and propagation of their species. In any case, one effect of such a practice is that it can aid us in living with greater openness to understanding others and ourselves, and thus into greater compassion and action for the well-being of each and all. Now that's the end of that excerpt, but I want to provide additional examples of how love can be so twisted that it may become unrecognizable. But before I go any further, please allow me to affirm that I don't condemn self-love. In fact, I think we cannot help but love ourselves in some way. It's a natural and healthy thing. Yet, like any dualistic manifestation of love, self-love can be distorted to unvirtuous extremes. On that note, let's consider how self-hatred and self-abuse can be rooted in love. We need to begin with asking why someone would hate or harm themselves. One explanation is that an individual feels a deeply captivating loyalty to, a love of, some expectation for what it means to be an acceptable person, while also judging self as failing to meet that standard and believing that the appropriate response is disdainful and punitive. This dynamic may be further aggravated by the notion perhaps a subconscious one, that feelings of guilt and shame and hostile actions against oneself are in and of themselves praiseworthy. In effect, loving oneself and being more lovable to others are paradoxically assumed to require self-loathing and self-harm. Now we can ponder something that many of us are deeply disturbed to see in our world today, and that is the rise of racial ethnic, religious, and nationalistic hatred and violence. Historians, sociologists, and anthropologists tell us that movements like these arise when economic, political, and cultural changes are experienced as threatening to people of a certain demographic. In our desire to protect and preserve things we cherish and with which we identify, in effect, things that we love, we lash out at the people of other demographics whom we regard as being dangerous or simply obstacles. In the clash between such groups and the individuals comprising them, there is a tendency to dehumanize and demonize the others, each seeing the others only as horrid beasts with no care or concern, no love for anything but their own pleasure and power. We may then rationalize our mistreatment of others and thus become the inhumane devils we judge them to be. Even so, it is love driving all of this, no matter how narrow, exclusive, and violent it becomes. Racism and other issues based in prejudice can also be motivated by beliefs about God and or nature that shape how we love. For instance, if we trust that God hates X, Y, and Z, and or that X, Y, and Z are unnatural, then we're likely to regard ridicule, condemnation, and aggression against X, Y, and Z to be expressions of our love for God, nature, humanity, and perhaps even for the people we are targeting. It begets a vicious cycle that all too easily justifies injustice as a necessary expression of love for everything we hold most sacred, and in the process we ironically create a world in which we too are more subject to injustice. These examples hardly cover the gamut of ways that we distort love, but they are perhaps enough to plant some seeds for developing further insight. One thing worth noting is their common factor of defining love in smaller ways, making it more conditional and less inclusive. When we limit love like this, we cannot avoid increasing tension between different expressions of love. 
Psychologically, this tension leads us to suffer internal conflict rather than harmonize the various parts of ourselves. Socially, it makes it seem more necessary to choose sides against others instead of working with them for mutual benefit. Spiritually, it bolsters the illusion of our separation from the divine and distances us from the greatest depths of meaning, peace, and joy in our lives. Despite these explanations, it's easy to see why the idea of non-dual love can be regarded as illogical, naive, or even dangerous. It's no surprise or offense to me if anyone decides to reject it, especially when, in the name of love, so many people have been exploited, abused, and conditioned to subjugate themselves. If, however, one feels a compelling draw to the possibility of an ever-present love with no opposites, then perhaps it deserves to be treated as more than an abstract concept, a silly fantasy or a tool of manipulation. Attraction to the non-duality of love can become part of the faith and hope that guides one's life. Contemplation of its incomprehensible depths can open one's heart and mind to more directly knowing the mysterious presence of the divine within oneself, in others, and in all things at all times. Indeed, embracing that attraction and engaging in this contemplation is an act of love for divine love, reflecting its energy back upon its source and thus more consciously participating in the circuit of light and life itself. Finally, through this embrace, we increase our potential for realizing the transcendent wisdom of divine love, which in turn guides us into more fully expressing the non-duality of love through its dualistic manifestations.